Callum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. There you go. That's a bit. That's best welcome. That wasn't that. That wasn't expected, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, so, for those of you who don't know anything about Callum, um, he runs an incubation space called Seed House and Accelerator. Um, and I'd just kind of like to start off the fireside chat with just a bit about you, how you got started, and how you kind of got into. Seed house. Sure. Um, yeah, so to put things in a bit of context, like probably a lot of people here, um, my background and career today was really all over the place. So I started off as a chemist, looked into commercialising a few products, learned a few lessons the hard way there, and was told to go get some commercial jobs. I then moved to the city in London, worked in finance for a while, and realised that was the wrong type of commercial jobs to get, and realised I wanted out of that space. I wanted to be involved with startup. Uh, communities, startup founders. I'm very much a fan of solving problems. So I was looking for mechanisms through which I could do that. The position became available at the University of Strathclyde for me to support the startups coming out of the university. And over the course of that period, I started to see a very real and tangible gap in the market that I thought CTOs could ultimately fill. Nice. Um, so you're what, what, what has your interest in investment in particular? Um, because it, it's, I know from moving into startups that it's a very intricate field and there's so many different viewpoints on it. Um, mm -hmm. So what, what had you, what, what had you, um, yeah. I suppose, into um, what's, So it, it's a bit of an odd thing to say, but I actually am not super interested in the, the investment side of things. It's a means to an end. Um, for me, Growing up, I used to think capitalism and making money was a bit of a grubby, dirty thing. Um, even back when I was uh, making my own products and things, I would try and you know, give them away to the world and thought that was the optimum source of doing that. Ultimately, what I found happening was people were, well, partners were not keen to engage because the stuff I was developing wasn't patented. It wasn't people's commercial interest. And as such, the stuff that I was building and putting out into the world wasn't getting out there. So to answer your question, it's a means to an end for me. The gig in the city certainly helped me understand the investment ecosystem much better than I think I would have had had I been back here. There are better ways to learn that, that, that type of uh, skill set, but it certainly opened my eyes to what good looks like, um, as well as to a few perhaps, dare I say, industry standards and for say industry standards, I'm talking about mechanisms and ways to invest. And that's very much geography specific. So I was very much exposed to that in a London sense. And then came back here and saw, hmm, this isn't really marrying up. There's a real disconnect with what's going on. More specifically, it's the way that people approach investing here. Um, we can dive into that in a, in a little bit. Yeah, second. yeah. Um, general interest, um, is there anyone that's looking to close around very soon or looking for investment in the near future? that's here. Two of you. Okay, interesting. Um, so, out, out, out of the two of you, are you looking within Scotland or are you looking out with? Anywhere. Anywhere. Any, <laughs> anywhere they'll give you money. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that kind of, we've, we've got loads to talk about. So, yeah. I just want to kind of start with what, what, what your opinion on the general investment scene in Scotland is. Mm -hmm. um, Bit of a loaded one in that I probably wouldn't be doing seed house if I thought it was perfect. Um, there are a lot of good points, a lot of money in Scotland, a lot of money in Edinburgh. It's historic and it has legacy issues with it, so a lot of the people that, that made that money, dare I say, they're of a certain age, a certain mindset, they bring a certain set of behaviours to the table, um, and I don't think we've really seen that evolve and that shift in Scotland. So if you were to map the Scottish angel ecosystem to some other geographies. Scotland's actually been doing angel investing for a lot longer, but people have traditionally been investing in businesses that weren't built to scale. And they're bringing those behaviours and those mechanisms of investing into scalable businesses. And so the sort of negative side to, to the Scottish ecosystem, I've seen friends go out to raise money and you know they're raising small sums like 50k and they're selling 25% of their business to do that. Now there is no way in hell you will scale a company by doing that. If Skyscanner had done that, if Fangio had done that, there's no way those would be names that we'd be mentioning just now. So yeah. there are problems there. I think we're on the, the, right, the right path. There's hopefully 
well, there's new angels coming on the scene. Um, so yeah, there's good things and bad things. So let's let's say you you kind of said there that a lot of the older money right now is essentially taking up a lot of yeah a lot of the investment capacity. Um, what do you think it will look like in maybe ten years when the likes of Skyscan and Fangio and the the next version of them have yeah. had their exits and they're then looking to do their VC or yeah. investment funds. I think it's an interesting one. Um, I actually think if there had been more activity like Seed House, I actually think it sounds like a, a really <laughs> daft thing to say. The best thing for Scotland is if we had more competition. Um, if there were three or four versions of what we're doing out there, you would then end up competing. You would mm -hmm. be educating more people as to how to do this. There would be bigger communities being built. Um, and I almost worry that we've missed the boat on that. Yeah. So I actually think company building will evolve and I actually think it's perhaps bad for Scotland as a geography to try and play catch up and to try and set up tech accelerators and incubators all over the space because I think a lot of these guys are going to be looking at different mechanisms through which to build, build companies. Yeah, I mean that, that kind of came up last night when we were at dinner um, where it's essentially there's, there's a lot of Yes, we can copycat yeah. the YCs, the 500 startups, mm -hmm. and all, all the successful investment or, or acceleration mm -hmm. um, companies in the world. Um, but is that going to be useful? Are we going to? Do we need to do something a little bit different in order to get ahead? Absolutely, because um, ultimately in Scotland, it's perhaps easy for us to articulate what Seed House is and to defend that against other forms of support and what other people are doing in the ecosystem. But as soon as we step out of Scotland, people are like, who gives a shit, you're another accelerator. Yeah. Um, and that's, that, that's true. People are looking at what's your differentiator. Now, I don't want it to be a case of our differentiator is our geography. That's simply not good enough. So I think we do need to evolve um, how we actually look to build companies and not play <coughs> catch up. Because if you take this parochial view, you could then kid yourself on that the picture's a lot rosier than it perhaps is in a global yeah. sense. Okay, so that kind of feeds into the next question a, a little bit. Um, what's one thing that we should be doing differently in both VC and in startups, mm -hmm. in both Scotland and worldwide? Um, sure. Scotland's going to have a different problem than we, we have worldwide. Yeah. So I think uh, to take the, the startups bit uh, to, to kick off with, and remind me to come back to the VC bit in case okay. I go off all around the houses, <laughs> um, it's something that Grant of, no I just thought he was just taking up here then, um, Grant <laughs> of uh, Noise Studios and I chatted about a lot and we were talking about it last night. I think startups need to focus much more on the problem that they're solving. Um, a phrase that we often use is people need to validate the problem. What I see a, a lot of is people coming with a solution. They're like, oh, I've got this either idea or yeah. they've even built it. Like, this solves problem X. And the first question is, does it really? I would much rather see people validate that there's a real problem to be solved. And if they can evidence that they're smart enough to solve it by hook or by crook, then I'm bought in and I'm excited by that. Yeah. I think too many people think, hmm, I've got this idea, I've convinced myself it's a good idea, I've thrown some money against some branding done, I've got a logo, I've built a website, you're now emotionally invested yeah. so in that concept. Yeah, and um, it's just, it's everything's back to front, so you end up far too tied to it, you can't take criticism, you can't pivot away from it. Um, and I would actually rather see the education piece in the startup ecosystem move from here's how you build a company to here's how you validate a problem. And I think, you know, we talked about that sort of day zero, day 300. Yeah. I would actually say you've got to go to day negative 10 to day zero because I think the way that we've set up where that starting line is, certainly within Scotland, we've overshot a lot of the early stage building blocks. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in Scotland, um, a lot of companies tend to think grant funding first yeah, and then we'll validate the problem later and yeah. that's, that's maybe yeah. what, what you're alluding to there as well. Absolutely and in a global sense I'm, I'm keen to, to make sure that it's uh, accessible for everyone to be able to build companies and I worry that if we as a sort of global community were to move away from accelerators or obvious so stuff like Y Combinator and Techstars if you're smart enough, you can get into those sort of premier institutions um, in the US and they are held up by some to be the, the premier, rightfully so, with, with their track records. 
Now, moving forward, there is more and more and more people coming out of places like Google and Facebook and all these types of things. So some people say that's super exciting, you've got all these great companies coming out of there, but you've just recreated the old boys network. So if you haven't worked for Google, how are you going to start a company? How are you getting those network connections? Yeah. And I do worry that, I get the feeling that perhaps we are moving away globally from um, that early first touch point that is available to everyone. And I do worry that we're going back to the old way of you have to know someone, which I don't think is necessarily fair. Yeah, that's, that's a valid point because, I mean, it's something that we talk a lot about but don't actually action diversity. And it's yeah. what, what our last talk at Startup Prime was about. Um, that that first touch point is a low barrier to entry. The barrier for entry for startups is never been lower. So, how do we? And I I know this from being in startups for five or six years. That what looks good in a pitch deck is Facebook, it's Google, it's being an ex engineer for yeah. for one of those companies or graduating from Stanford yeah. from um, from a large university, and that's the only way that you're going to get money in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, and I've, I was in a lift one day and my, my lift driver told me that because he also ran a startup because everyone runs startups in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley, including the taxi drivers. <laughs> um, but how, how, do we, how do we lower that barrier to entry again then? Um, well, there are people looking into it. Um, in fact, I think it's quite apt. So um, I'm a big fan of uh, Hustle VC that they've just set up shop in, in the Bay Area. It's folks that came out of 500 startups, interestingly, um, their leadership team were taken down by the Me Too movement, which I think speaks to <laughs> the diversity point and a lot of the, uh, the issues certainly within the VC um, community. The folks have come out there, they've been very meritocratic about how they're, how they're setting things up and I think that's a super exciting model. But, um, to almost circle back to the VC point, you'll hear VCs and investors talk about pattern matching. Um, to me, that's just another, uh, I'm borrowing a link from our good pal Harry Stebbings, but that yeah. is just a cognitive bias. So you've convinced yourself that if you've went to Stanford and you've studied electrical engineering, you will do well with your business. You know, if you've seen that two or three times, it's easy to convince yourself of things, and humans are actually very um, susceptible to that type of uh, fact-based input. And I think it, you, you have to be cognizant of the fact that pattern matching is a lot of bullshit. And if you call it that, then you will start to pick out truly diverse teams that are capable of doing amazing things. So, yeah, that's um, so pattern matching is only really relevant at the early stage of investing. Would you agree or disagree? With to, an, that? to an extent, within my limited experience of going to sort of series A, series B, and, and knowing people in that space, you will see people just gravitating to what's hot right now. So, for example, electric scooters. Um, I wouldn't be dismissive and say, oh, there's nuts. If Sequoia are throwing a shit ton of money at them, there's probably something in it. And yeah. you know, I don't want to be the guy that says, oh, this is insane, because I think they, they know what they're doing. But I think a lot of other people look at Sequoia and they'll use that as a frame. So, all right, we want to invest in this. We don't really know what good looks like. So we know that good in industry X looks like this. Let's just push that onto what we expect to see. In, in this. I don't know if that yeah. necessarily makes sense, but I think they are borrowing um, heuristics from other. Yeah, so it's a little bit like what we were talking about earlier. Um, if you're behind in the game, then it doesn't make yeah. sense to yeah. copy the big boys. Absolutely. What makes sense is to actually blaze your own path. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's go back to St. House for a second. Um, I feel like we've taken a massive detour into the world of mm. VC and the world of investment um, and I'm glad you reminded yourself instead of me reminding you because <laughs> I nearly forgot. Um, so if you were to choose anyone um, for, in fact first of all um, I'd like you to kind of, if I, who knows about the Seed House model and what um, Seed House do of everyone, one or two of you. Um, so I think it'd be useful first of all yeah. to explain your model a little bit Sure. and then um, if you were to have a partner come on board at Seed House, worldwide, who would it be? That's a good question. Um, okay, so in terms of Seed House and what it is and what we do, it was set up to address this problem that I was articulating earlier, where we were seeing really credible people that didn't necessarily have that opportunity to get their first 
first bit of funding, which I think this is really interesting. It's almost like a, a self-filtering process. We invest 30k, which is a small sum of money. We would take 8% equity for that. So based on the fact that the way the deal is structured, roughly speaking, companies are getting a valuation of about half a million straight off the bat, which is pretty, pretty good going in Scotland. Um, that gives founders a toehold for future raises, mm -hmm. but it also gets the right people around them. So I would argue that they've debatably got the most impressive cap table in the UK. The list of investors getting involved is Chris van der Keil, it's Rob Dobson, it's my co-founder Robin Knox. It's fantastic people that, that are involved in what they're doing. And what happens is we'll invest in five opportunities. They'll co-locate with us in our office in Edinburgh. We'll work closely for six months. At the end of that six months, uh, we'd ask them to start paying us rent if they want to stick around or they're free to, to move on, but we would help them with a variety of things over that. So we're almost like a pseudo co-founder in a way. Um, and it's just a way to help people properly set up for going to speak to real institutional investors. So you could potentially leapfrog some of the, the investors that would perhaps limit your options. Um, so that's a, that's a big bit of, of what we do. Um, we're across verticals um, and we've only been going nine months, so uh, yeah, we're getting there. Um, and to, to answer your question around who would I like to be involved, so to describe our investors, so we've got 10 investors that, that uh, back what we do and we invest their money directly in startups. Um, in terms of an individual, probably <coughs> Elizabeth Yin. Um, who runs the VC firm that I just mentioned. So she's X 500 startups. I learned a ton from her. Um, she really demystified seed investing, the metrics that people will be looking for, the behaviors, how to articulate what you're doing well. Um, she's been phenomenal. Um, and if there was any way to work with her in the future, that'd be awesome. Um, so Let's, let's talk a bit about, um, I'm jumping around in my questions here a little bit, um, just purely off of what you've said. Um, so we were talking a lot last night about tech startups and um, who would actually be able to benefit from a wider Glasgow ecosystem evolving. Um, what kind of companies would be able to get the most value out of Seed House as, um, yeah. as a partner? Um, so there needs to be a tech component to what people are doing, but I think um, it almost comes back to the behaviour perspective, so if you want to be very binary about it, there will be people, so you, you'll see this in different environments, you'll see it in any, any space where someone's being coached, whether that's a sports team, whether it's university setting, whatever, some people will turn up for everything, they'll do all the assigned work that you give them, they'll, yeah, they'll plod through it, they don't give anyone any grief, they're solid and steady, but the ones that really take the people that really take the onus and they look to extract maximum value from an experience, that's who we get most value from, from Seat House. So yeah, you can rock up and you can sit in our goal sessions, you can do our workshops, but it's the folks that are then banging on the doors of all the Seat House partners saying who in your network should I be speaking to, yeah. they're jumping on planes to the US and to London, they're leveraging the connections that we've got, who do you guys know on the ground in New York, hit them up, they'll fly to San Francisco, who do you guys know, they'll hit them up, and you see others that will just kind of plod along with things. Um, and I think if you're of the mindset where you look to extract maximum value for something, that's... Yeah, and that's that's in the same vein, the types of founders that get the most out of startup brain as a network, because we have so many cities all over the world, and having that touch point in every city, banging on the doors and saying, oh yeah, New York, you should speak to Josh and John. Or, okay, you're going to Rome, you should go and speak to yeah. Louisa. And that's, those are the type of people that get the most out Absolutely. of and I, th and I think startups. it's something that a lot of people will use, people wait for permission a lot of the time. I think that's actually really bad. In Scotland, I think it's even worse than Glasgow, and I say that as a Glaswegian. People wait for permission to do things, which sounds nuts given how we tend to behave as a, as a small uh, society. But it's, it's that whole, oh, is it okay for me to, to go down? When's the signal that I should be jumping on a plane and going to London? When should I be banging on the door of something? It's something that, that Grant and I, and I think yourself, were talking about last night. You can access pretty much anyone in the world, in the tech space or within the startup space, on Twitter. If you're capable at how you approach them, you can find their email, they're in different Slack communities. 
I think the stuff's out there. Don't wait for someone to either intro you or... But what I would say is be very clear and concise with your ask. If you are trying to get in front of someone who's busy or receives hundreds of these types of things, make it something, a very clear, concise ask that is easy to come back on. And it's especially relevant if it's something that that person is incredibly well placed to answer. Yeah. Um, you know, just asking a general, oh, how should I incorporate my company? To you know, that's a sort of bullshit question to ask. But if you were to reach out to, um, I don't know, someone within your, your your domain space, if you've got a question that's particularly relevant, in my experience, they, they will come back. So my next question, there is a right answer to it. Um, and you'll, you'll know as soon as I ask it. Um, what type of founder would you like to see come through Seed House? Um, the right answer's me. <laughs> <laughs> probably, um, uh, probably someone that yeah likes to validate problems. I sound like I'm repeating myself, but it's super important, and I really can't overstate that. If you have proven that what you're working on is a real problem, and people want it solved, and there's a variety of ways to do that, and we can chat about that later on if that's useful to people. That's of interest. People that are driven. Um, one thing that I actually s I didn't think of encounter, but I, I have. Um, some people will treat it um, almost like the X factor, and that you get this weird emotive pitch of how much they want something, and that's that doesn't come over how people might yeah. think it does. Um, and it's also that you know you probably you probably even shouldn't say this, but it's the making the other side feel like they're about to miss out on something great. That's super mm -hmm. important. And that comes back to that point I made just now about permission. If you were to say, oh, we're raising 150K and we need it, otherwise this isn't going to happen, that's a completely different story to, we're raising 150K and we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and if you don't do it, somebody else will. That's a very compelling, and yeah. you can really get behind that. I, th I think there's a level though where that becomes a bit too much um, because I, I, I was listening to 20 Minute VC which is a podcast we both listen to and we, we reference quite a lot um, in conversation um, essentially a lot of the Y Combinator companies mm -hmm. what they've been getting into the habit of becoming too pushy yeah. um, and saying oh yeah I've got this round it's closing tomorrow and you're going to miss out um, and the valuation is this, and then the next day they come back and say, oh, by the way, the valuation's been up because we've hired an, another engineer and we're worth more now, so yeah. um, you need to pay more. Yeah. Um, and investors have kind of got a bit privy to that and said, yes, that's not going to happen, because often a lot of those companies that say they're around their closing tomorrow yeah. are around four weeks later and still looking for that same yeah. pot of money. Um, so where, where is that line? I think it's a tough one. Um, I would actually side with Y Combinator probably more than the VCs because I think there is tremendous asymmetry in that relationship and what I mean by that is the investors hold all the power. Um, I've seen it a couple of times where people will come into a sort of negotiation piece and I, we're certainly not hostile, that's not in the spirit of what we do, but some people perhaps try and put forward terms that are unpalatable. But they forget, we see hundreds of these, and this is the first time they've ever done a deal. Um, so that, that imbalance is unfair for a startup. Yeah. Um, what they did with Y Combinator is, as a community, they tried to leverage and create a little bit of a FOMO, um, mm -hmm. as you well know, um, which perhaps a bit disingenuous. I think the, you know, the valuation going up because they're a new engineer, that's a bit shitty. <laughs> um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think it is okay for for founders to chance their arm. I mean, but at the same time, if someone were to say, oh, we've got this deal and it's closing next week, uh, straight away I'm like, all right, good luck with it, I'm not getting involved. Um, what, what I mean by that is don't necessarily time bar it. It's, it's better to get behind the ambition of someone rather than to feel compelled because of the time frame that it's set with. It's probably the best way of calculating yeah. that. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, coming back to, Startups now. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a little bit about um, what type of founder you like to see yeah. earlier on. Um, so, what's your opinion on um, loan co founder, loan, yeah. found, loan founders versus a co founding yeah. team? Because I know a, a lot of people are split on it. Yeah, uh, I'm absolutely fine with solo founders. I don't know where the co founder thing has come from. A lot of people get hung up on it. Um, 
I can see why. Um, it's certainly it's a lot of burden to bear, but I th again, not to, to keep banging on about geographies and things, but if you were to if you were to be in the valley, for example, chances are there are a ton of people who would make for, in a, in a tech sense, really good CTO co-founders. And what I mean there is they've got the skill set to not only build out the product, but potentially a team of ten people. Yeah. If you come back here, what I often see is people, so CEOs, people with deep domain knowledge. Um, people that are commercially savvy, if they're needing tech talent, they'll find a really good software developer, but that person isn't a CTO. And what I mean by that is that individual isn't capable of leading a team of 10, 20, 30 people. Yeah. Um, so I would actually rather see a solo founder with a good team around them than two co-founders where you know one of them, you're going to have to have a very awkward conversation. Um, yeah. So, um, we But I think in other geographies, uh, I would maybe change my answer. Right, okay. Um, we touched on this a little bit last night as well. Um, what's your opinions on, I mean, we, we had one of them come and speak um, last year um, at, at Startup Grind. Uh, what's your opinions on companies that do almost CTO as a service and invest in companies with yeah. the resource to build that technology team straight away? I, th I quite like the model. I think. Um, what I think works well there is if the CTO is a service, if that's tied up with the investment, then it's really geared around actually hitting certain metrics. So if it's a case of, we can cobble together this product, we can probably give you about 10k a month MRR, we can get to those sorts of standards, and we've got a black book of people who tend to follow on our companies. I think there's value there. Um, I think there's ways of position, and again, in certain geographies, the US, they'll, they'll hate it. They absolutely hate that sort of stuff. I prefer it in the UK because, as I say, I would rather see something built properly. Um, and there's every chance that people would perhaps get on and, and, and um, actually jump in if the company is, is on the right trajectory. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually a fan of the sort of CTO as a, as a service, certainly up until, um, you know, a sort of proper seed, Series right. A stage. Um, so I'm, I'm jumping about a little bit, I apologise if um, I'm, I'm, it's hard to follow, um, but it, it, just something you said there um, about following on, how, how much of your investments in Seed House do the partners tend to follow on from the pre-seed round to actually raising the next yes, seed round? Yes, so right now we've got our first cohort who just finished up with us, so one of them is pub kind of public. Um, so yeah, one's kind of public and <laughs> there's another two that might be, but we'll wait and see. What we do with CTOs though is when uh, Rob and I were first set up, we were actually offered money by um, investors in London on the condition that they would get first look at everything that we built, which we're not comfortable with. Um, mm -hmm. One, I don't like that principle. Two, it's effectively the kiss of death. So if that company said, oh, we actually don't know how to build your ag tech company, it looks really cool, we really rate you, but it's not for us, the rest of the market would signal as, oh, this is a pile of shit, we don't want to touch it. Yeah. Um, so that's why we didn't get involved with that, and we're very strict around, you don't get right of, um, you know, first right of refusal or any of that sort of stuff. Um, so the option is there for them. Um, but one thing to bear in mind about how we operate, and it's something I'm, uh, passionate about and it's still not line from Amazon we've got a disagree and commit mentality so when we're assessing investment opportunities if we were to back stuff that everyone thought yeah that's kind of okay I would argue perhaps trending towards the median whereas if you're to back the stuff that half of the room are like that is amazing and the other half like I don't get it there's a great chance you're going to hit an outlier doing that um, which then obviously follows on, means there'll be some stuff coming out the other end that some of the CTO's partners are perhaps like, I don't get it, That's um, right. yeah. which is absolutely fine obviously. Um, and I think as well it's important for people to spread their own wings. It is, I would be concerned if the founders thought they're on some sort of a conveyor belt, because um, you want to see that fight, you want to see them go out and raise externally. That's another sort of uh, social proof point, um, and just legitimises on that, that extra way. So again, that, that's something else that I found um, through hearing through the grapevine about how Y Combinator does business. Um, 
that the cohort of Y Combinators may be 60 or 70 companies. Out of those 60 or 70 companies, the top five or six, mm -hmm. they're already invested in by the time demo day happens. Yeah. So there is a first right to refusal yeah. embedded within that yeah. accelerator. So the friends, the partners, or whoever else has already invested by the time it gets in front of the, the overall investors that they pitch to on yeah. the day. Um, so, I mean, I've heard a school of thought that if you're an investor in demo day and you haven't invested, you're already the chump. Yeah. Um, but would you disagree with that? Certainly within Scotland. Um, it's perhaps different with YC um, based on the track record of what they've done today. And I know historically the partners there didn't follow on because they were worried about signaling, but they changed their tune about halfway through. Um, there is obviously the fact that the CTOS partners, because they are our advisors, etc., they are seeing the opportunities as they progress. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's only fair if they're putting the money in and working with the guys that yeah. obviously an organic relationship can evolve and they can sure. get involved. Yeah, um, and that's that, that was the bugbear that I heard of, that mentors were taking up a lot of the, the bandwidth of yeah. the, the startups investment round. Um, but again, I don't, I don't particularly see a problem with it there. Yeah. Um, because that's the way that they build their business model and everyone wins. Um, so coming back to team building and as an early stage founder, um, I know a couple of you are early stage in the room. Um, if you were starting off day one just now, mm -hmm. how would you go about building a team? Um, what I wouldn't do is the sort of CTO thing. I wouldn't just go out and find somebody. To, so I would see myself as either a sort of CEO or a coup type role. I wouldn't want to be in charge of tech. I'm not quite to, to be in charge of tech. Um, I should caveat that. Um, so you would then, you, you don't want to shoot yourself in the fruit. Don't be over advised. Some people think it legitimizes them. If they rock up and you know, you got, well I've got a board of 10 advisors. I'm like head in my hands like how do we get these people not involved in this business. Um, also startup competitions. They're fine if you want to do them, but they're not the social proof point that you think they are. Um, I've actually had investors advise me, if a startup rocks up to you and they've got six or seven prizes, don't get involved with them. Um, and that's from someone, that, a name that people would know. Um, so those are a few things that I would just be wary of. Um, I wouldn't chase competition after competition. Um, and again, it's something we are talking about last night. I think it's amazing when all of a sudden this company just springs up out of nowhere and they're doing amazing stuff because they haven't necessarily tapped into uh, the startup or tech ecosystem. I love the support uh, that's afforded by the startup and tech ecosystem, but remember your business is in your own vertical. So don't just go to startup events. You should, you know, if you're in, I don't know, if you've got a CRM company, you should be at trade shows and all those types of things. Uh, I often see founders do that, they forget to actually double down in their own vertical and they think their, their vertical and their space is startups. Um, so mm -hmm. that's something to avoid. Stuff that I would actively do, I would probably try and come up with as many problems that I was interested in as possible. So I'd maybe have about five, six, seven problems. I'd build really shitty landing pages for each of them. I would then find communities where I think they would want that problem solved, whether that is physical groups, meetups, Reddit communities, Facebook groups, do whatever you can to get people to that, yeah. that landing page. If you can clearly articulate the problem, a potential solution, and a little mailing list sign up button, that's a great way to, to actually test, is this something people are interested in having solved for them? Yeah, and I mean, as a, I think Product Hunt have done that really well as a service. Absolutely. They've given you the ability just to create that mailing list and to create that valid that instant validation from scratch. Yeah. Pay them for the for the privilege of it, but you have that platform to then launch in Absolutely. the future. And it's something that they've been doing internally for yeah. the past five, six years. Yeah. I mean Ben Tosso, who is um, who used to work for Product Hunt, he has now started his own startup out of several different ideas that he's, he's had throughout the years that he's worked there. Um, and it's worked. Um, he had one of the most read media articles in the world mm -hmm. um, just through, it was on Start Ground um, Medium, um, Medium Channel. 
Um, and it was just through word of mouth and mm -hmm. through him experimenting and him Absolutely. testing out ideas. So that's that's ultimately I think the way to go about doing it is test ideas. If you can gen you know, you're trying to find evidence that's a real problem. So generating revenue, that's one. Um, that's a very obvious one mm -hmm. and definitely not to be sniffed at. I think a lot of people forget actually need to generate revenue because certainly um, B2C business to consumer businesses, they are built on the premise that you have to scale quick, aggressively, um, and that, that makes sense within that market. But if you're a B2B SaaS offering, generate some revenue. Um, there's no need for you to be pre-revenue if it's something that adds value. And a very yeah. easy way to evidence is this legitimate. If you've got three or four paying customers, you're suddenly at the front of the pack from everyone who's trying to do something. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of people forget that. So, you're, you invest in a lot of companies with Seed House, um, Y Combinator have got the very own like request for startup board. Mm -hmm. Today in Scotland, if you were to see the next startup mm -hmm. sprout out mm -hmm. from um, wherever they come from, <laughs> um, what would you want to see tomorrow? So, yeah. Um, selfishly, probably chemistry, that's what my background's in, so it'd probably be kind of fun to do that. I, I always had this, um, when I left chemistry, my I, I thought, I was getting out of a time where I was waiting on the technology, the, the sort of software side of things, not white chemistry, the software side of things had to catch up before I came back to it. Um, so I reckon it'd be 10 or 15 years before it's right to, to jump back in. So selfishly, that'd be quite fun. Um, I think legitimately, we're probably well served to get a really great fintech company out of Scotland. Um, my co-founder at Seat House, Robin Knox, and his co-founder at IPOS, Paul Walton, in my opinion, they've, they've built a fantastic fintech opportunity. You've got free agent, but it would be awesome to see a real powerhouse, you know, yeah. a real sort of Revolut, TransferWise, yeah, yeah, something of that nature. And I actually would argue that we've definitely got the skill set to do it. Um, there's a lot of back office finance support across the central belt of Scotland. There's a lot there. A lot of people understand processes, but the access to capital, the sort of front of house component is all London centric. So I think if someone was able to bridge those two worlds, you could build something really powerful here. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't on my question seat. I'm just throwing a few hard balls here. I'm really sorry. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously you mentioned free agent there. They, they were just acquired by RBS. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on large corporate companies like that getting involved at the early stages of companies like free agent um, fintech, yeah. power, fintech startups? I think uh, I think it is good for them to get involved, but I think the uh, they do the they do things that actually don't add value, and there's a lot of things they could do to add value. So it'll be a case of oh, we'll give you our staff pro bono, and they'll look at your accounts. It's like we don't need that. Um, there are a hundred other things we need. It's not that. Yeah. Um, not to keep referencing them, but I, I do want to give them credit. It's something that Grant and I were talking about the other day there. <laughs> you're, um, you're famous, Grant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I need to give him his due here. We were having this conversation with a, a, a party from a sort of corporate space, and um, Grant straight away said, the biggest thing you can do is sales. If you could even take two or three seats of our product at 50 quid a go, that legitimizes us hugely. If you, know, you throw up that slide to... Um, either other potential customers or users or investors, that the legitimacy, legitimacy, legitimacy <laughs> associated with that is huge. And I think that's something the corporates could do to add a lot of value, but instead they focus on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think they should also be friendlier with letting their staff explore startup activity. So whether or not, I, I love this idea of they're almost been like a startup charter that they would agree that 0.01% of their staff can go do a startup sabbatical. Um, because like that's, the that's what's missing in Scotland. There's a lot of people with deep domain knowledge, but the infrastructure isn't really there to, to get them going. I mean, you know, you can go do like a Saltar fellowship or something like that, but what, you've got to stop earning for a year and you've got to throw money out the door. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> it's a good program, but there should be another mechanism through which if you want to build a company, you can be supported, um, and I think corporates can do a lot there. Um, the the danger is, and I saw this actually when I was with KPMG, 
you see people like directors and partners trying to advise startups and they really don't know what they're doing yeah. and instead of just saying oh I, I actually don't understand this they'll try and shift the conversation to an area that they understand and like that's employees financing yeah yeah <laughs> and that's that's very damaging um but no i don't have any sort of anti-corporate you know no neither, neither do i <laughs> oh. um right so we've not got that much time left before we open up to questions so if anyone's got any questions we'll we'll get to them in a couple of minutes um quick fire um two questions that i've got here um Coming back to the title of the talk, the first 300 days, what are the first, what, what are the top three mistakes that you see startup founders making consistently in those first mm -hmm. 300 days, that first year, that can be avoided? Uh, build the wrong thing. Um, they ask for permission. And what I mean by that is the whole, I need this money to do this. As soon as you've done that, the dynamics kind of shit in an investor meeting. Um, Advised by the wrong people, um, yeah, that's a big one. Solving a problem that has already been solved pretty well. Um, right, uh, <laughs> there is a, and one thing that annoys, uh, it especially annoys me, when someone pitches a product or an idea, and I know their competitors better than they do. That's a huge bugbear of mine. That's credibility is done um, as soon as that happens. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I don't disagree with any of them at all. Um, so last one, I've asked this to every speaker that I've had at Startup Grind and I love seeing what the, what the answers are to it um, and it's, it's kind of how I end every single one. So tell me one thing that you believe to be true that almost no one agrees with you on. Uh, probably a few things actually. <laughs> um, one thing that I'm really passionate about, so I spent a lot of my life in higher education, uh, either studying or working in that environment, and I came from a relatively working class background, it was always a case of go to university, get a job, and I used to think, oh this is great, you know, you, you've got this sort of assembly line of credible people coming out the other end, it's really training people for the world. I actually think universities shouldn't train people for the world, I think you should go to university just because you're interested in certain things. And I see too many people go to university for the wrong reasons and they graduate and they're like, what next? What do I do now? I did, you know, course X. I thought I would get a job in this industry. And it's like, yeah. no. Um, at first I used to feel sorry for them, but it's a case of university. I, 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 I'm passionate about focusing on stuff that's interesting. And I think it's absolutely fine for people to study things that you know, go study philosophy at university, if that interests you, do it, it's amazing um, and you'll grow so much as a person. But I think we as a society view universities as a pipeline for a workforce and I don't yeah. think that's fair I, and I think fewer people should probably go to university as a result. And I don't mean that in an elitist sense, I mean that in, if you want to go work in a certain industry, just go work in that industry. So you think the premise behind the education system is broken as opposed to the education yeah. system itself? I think the education system itself is also broken. Oh yeah, <laughs> that, that's a good way to end it. So does anyone have any questions for Cal? Don't be shy. Mark? Well, when you've got a start up, how much of your own money should you put into it um, versus how much you bring in externally? Um, it's a good question. So I, I wouldn't say there's any hard and fast rules if you've got the capacity to you know build out a really really crude proof of concept you know and it's a couple of grand and you've got the bandwidth to do that i think that's an perhaps the uh the way i would frame that is what sort of milestone could i get to before it starts getting daft uh, you know don't go remortgaging stuff or uh one way to frame it um and i think it's a great way to, to if you're looking to do any sort of new project is way up against the cost of doing a qualification. So you can go do an MBA and it'll cost you 30 grand or you can try and launch a startup and use that same 30 grand. You, I work for a university and I'm not colleagues of your front row is made up of university uh, people. <laughs> you're probably gonna learn more investing that thirty K in yourself and try to launch a startup. If that is what you're after, if you want to go get a job with the lawyer or that, yeah, go to the MBA. But I would equate it to does this credentialise me in a way that I perhaps couldn't through other mechanisms and is that the price I'm willing to pay in terms of the, 
sort of personal development at the stage of life I'm at. I hope that I, 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 there's no sort of ten percent of what you yeah, hope to raise or that I wouldn't. I suppose I wasn't looking for. You're right. I'm feeling the pressure now. I wasn't looking for a number. Sure. I yeah. Discuss it. And the other one question I had was: if you've got people working for you or with you mm -hmm. on your startup idea, yeah. Uh, how do you invest them in product? Yeah. Equity or, or yeah. To pay them? What was the best method to do that? So I think there are ways to get people involved and to, to really buy into what you're doing. Um, certainly allocating equity, you perhaps want to set up more of a, a proper stock options pool because there, there's various tax implications involved if you were to do it perhaps too early um, and you end up with a pretty messy cap table with a nice options pool. What you can do in the meantime, I think it's actually setting the culture right. So if you've got a fantastic culture, you'll get people motivated um, and it's stuff that I learned from guys like, uh, well I know them, but Jason Fried and David Heinemeiner Hansen, the guys from Basecamp, they've written some fantastic books on, on workplace culture. Um, I mean, they're big fans of remote working um, just, and, and nice little incentives so, you know, you couldn't necessarily offer them, you know, a bit of healthcare and a company car and all that sort of stuff, but yeah, you could maybe do, you know, 50 quid if, if the person's interested in photography, why not buy them a photography course? You know, there's lots of nice little things I think you can do that really foster a real sense of camaraderie and teamwork that actually, you know, you could probably achieve a lot with £1,500 versus, you know, setting up an options pool and, and all the rest of it. And that stuff will come at milestones. And if you're asking those types of questions, then you're obviously the type of person that would want to look after your team anyway. And I'm sure that would come across with your, with your team. Sorry to. No, no. You've got a small company, you've only got one or two people working with you. Yeah. Uh, I, I really believe in let people do things that they love to do. Yeah. Otherwise, you're not very good at it. Yeah. But we've got such a small company, you have to do a bit of everything. Yeah. So, so I was thinking, well, are you getting some kind of investment in the company through yeah. this, people with those options? Yeah. to get them to do the stuff they don't enjoy doing? Because yeah. the company is so small. It's a bit of a bootstrap problem. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I hear where you're coming from, but. I would perhaps challenge an assumption in there and are you convinced that it's a real blocker for them to do the stuff that they don't enjoy doing? Because I think sometimes founders forget, oh I don't really want to do that shit and I, I feel like I own this. Why doesn't everybody else think like that? And there's a lot of people that I enjoy this journey, yeah there are bits of my jobs that I don't necessarily love doing, but it's a means to an end. Um, and at the end of the day, it's you that's worried about making payroll every month. Um, <laughs> So I, I don't mean to dismiss the, 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 the point, um, but I think founders sometimes overanalyze um, the, the setup. I think if you've got a strong culture, if you're looking after them, um, and then there's opportunities uh, to, to, to bring them on. I think it's fantastic if everyone's got a little bit of pie. I'm a big believer in that, I really am. Um, but I've also seen people dish out inappropriate amounts of equity at the wrong time. Um, one thing I would quickly add, slightly off topic, but I often see um, someone started an opportunity, maybe run at it for about six months, get a bit of traction, they bring on a co-founder, and I mean a co-founder in the truest sense, they would start seeing things like, oh, I've got us to this stage, so how about we do 75, 25, 70, 30? But if this is going to work, you're perhaps going to be working together for the next 10 years. So, yeah, 50 50. Um, yeah. And I'm a big believer in that. It's the premise of an idea's worth nothing. Yeah, exactly. And kind of add on to your culture point as well. I feel more invested in companies like Basecamp, like Buffer, um, than I have with a lot of companies that I've worked with. Purely for the reason that their culture and their transparency fits with my core beliefs more than the companies that I worked with did. And that's not anything to do with equity, that's not anything to do with options, that's to do with what they stand for and how it fits in with my beliefs. So interesting the culture. I work for a big company at Edinburgh, one of the mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And they had a day where they said to everyone, let's all decide what our culture is in the company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And people had to write up three things that they wanted the culture of the company to be. Yeah. You can't design a, a culture, can you? Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, I, I I've been that. I've had that same thing in a corporate environment. They're like, "Oh, let's decide what our culture is," and it's like, "It is what it is." Um, yeah. it should be more organic. Else yeah. It's just fall, especially startups. It's got to be oh, for sure. It should be set with the founders as well. Yeah. Um, because a lot of founders, it's an extension of their personality. It's what the culture ends up being. Mm -hmm. um, so without without that, then it's going to become an ugly baby that you don't actually want. 
So. Is that okay though? Because maybe the founder's wrong. Ugly babies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I don't want to be good at being ugly or something. I, I think in order to be invested as a founder for 10 years plus, you need to believe in what the company's doing as, as a core concept. Would you be worried about like losing the staff, for example, because if, if it's a, come from a place of, um, one thing I like to do is I, I'd like to work with people who want to launch their own startup. So it's a case of, why don't you come work with us for like two years and I'll teach you as much as we can. And when you go, um, you know, we'll open up all the doors we can. When you're here, you know, we'll give people a, a book allowance, a travel allowance for conferences. I mean, it's not much, you know, don't get me wrong, but it's enough to hopefully show people why they care about their own personal growth. Yeah, I love that, it should hold on too tight. Yeah, yeah. and it's, I, th I think that, that's huge because that then fosters a, a real sense of belonging. And even if they do, move on and do their own thing, the bridges are hopefully so intact you don't lose all that nice institutional knowledge you've built up. Yeah, yeah. and then I mean in technology, a, a general computer scientist or a programmer, their lifespan at a company is two to three years at most. Um, so you are going to have that turnover regardless, um, so why not turn it into something nice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, anyone else? Hassan? Uh, how long before Glasgow shares the same startup ecosystem as Edinburgh? Oh, we're talking about that. <laughs> that, was nice. that was the topic that of the dinner last night. Last night yeah. <laughs> what are the barriers together? Um, one, and I say this as a proud Glaswegian, do we need to? In all honesty. Um, and yeah, there's a few barriers. I, I think Edinburgh is, uh, has a few things going well. So the university there is very startup friendly and spin out friendly. Um, there is a lot of money there um, and you can even look at the, the, the data online so if you look at sources like Tech Nation, even if you're to look at user uh, numbers in, on GitHub, you'll see there's a lot more activity in Edinburgh relative to Glasgow. I would actually respectfully try and pivot it to more, it was uh, a name I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get out there so please start using it, but instead of it <laughs> being, uh, you know, you talk about Silicon Valley or the water the corridor in Canada, I think it'd be really nice to have more of a tech belt in Scotland. Because um, there's things I think we do better here in Glasgow. I think we are very uh, creative. Um, but at the same time, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. I think we should take advantage of what's right on our doorstep. Um, you know, build your company here, set yourself up here, go raise money in Edinburgh or London. Um, I, I think uh, if you were to ask the world to look at Glasgow differently, no one would really care. But I think if we just crack on and we're just so good that people can't ignore us, that's a different way of framing it. Um, which sounds a bit negative. I, don't, I, I, I do think there's things we should do better. I think we were talking about a few things last night. Um, just enhancing sort of meetup activity, but a more physical, I don't know, there never really seems to be like a, a home for activity in Glasgow. Um, Start yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there, you you got this um, and some other stuff, but there's plenty of startups doing cool stuff here that a lot of people don't really know about. Um, and I think there is a little bit of um, that being a cultural thing and a belief thing. So in Edinburgh, people are buying on about, oh yeah, we've just raised like half a million. Whereas I think those announcements are generally bullshit. They're uh, like narcissistic. But you can deploy them effectively. So yeah, we've raised half a million. Don't believe you're on bullshit, but yeah, I'm going to try and hire that amazing person from Deliveroo because our stock's pretty high. And I think that's a behaviour that we should enhance in Glasgow. Um, it's fine to, uh, to shout about things and to get market and press. Doesn't mean you have to believe any of it. Um, it's, it's something I feel strongly about. Coming, you want to yeah, coming from the self-confessed um, king of the press release himself. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, one thing that I wouldn't agree with was your use of tech belt because I quite like Silicon Glen, so it's a bit of a war of the. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think that's got too many old school connotations from all the semiconductor guys. I'll take your point on board. So I'll start with the <laughs> man. <laughs> um, so we'll get time for one more question. No, you had your hand. I was going to ask the same question. Why did you start with Steve House in Edinburgh rather than Glasgow? Great question. It would be a lot. Of, I live five minutes from here, so I'd have loved to. Have. <laughs> um, two points: the uh, the investor landscape. Investors, and this is true 
you could almost substitute and run London as well. Um, investors won't move more than like five miles from where they live or where they work. So you've got to be right on that doorstep. Um, and then back to that point, so if you're looking at two components, the number of deals, number of investors, etc., heavy in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. and the number of people starting startups um, to the tech space, and the, not only the number, but one thing that I thought was very interesting was the, uh, the competency across the 16 most popular programming languages in Edinburgh is very strong. In Glasgow, we're good at a, a fair few, but it's basically London and Edinburgh are strong across the board. Um, so that was another, and not only that, if, if we're being uh, very honest, that's a very compelling message to give to investors as well, of yeah. why, why Edinburgh. Um, it would have made my life a whole lot easier if it was possible. I, th I think that comes, it, it speaks to our corporate culture in terms of computer science mm -hmm. here in Glasgow. Um, again, we were touching on it last night, but the likes of JP Morgan um, the likes of Barclays, their core competencies are Java, yeah, and maybe some PHP in there, yeah. Um, but they don't really have much in terms of the top five program language. Yeah. They they're an established business. Absolutely. Um, so it's maybe partly to do with yeah. the fact that a lot of computer science graduates, yeah, tend to just spear out into those big companies. Absolutely, and it goes back to yeah. just going to hoover up. Um, I mean, it was it was the core language when I was in university for all of the year that I was there. Um, that it's Java. You're being taught Java because that's what the recruiters want, that's what the companies that are recruiting want. Mm -hmm. um, and that fits really well into that. Yeah. Um, so that, that kind of tails off quite nicely actually. Um, so Stephanie, I know you um, wanted to say a few things. Um, Stephanie's from Scottish Enterprise. Um, she has a fantastic Scottish ecosystem guide which is right behind her. Um, do you want to come up and say a few words um, about that yeah, just before yeah, we, we finish up? Uh, that would be great. Um, so what Cal mentioned a couple of times about the support ecosystem, support for startups here. That's something that we've been trying to map out across Scotland. I think we all know what every new startup business we've thought about it here is they know or the first the great find there's a lot of support out there but it's not quite clear who to go to find, how to tap into it. It's very word of mouth at the moment. So we've been making an attempt to combat that out. Um, one of the brochures I've got here, uh, you haven't picked up already, is kind of about that, what we're aiming for in terms of ambitious entrepreneurship in Scotland. The Scottish Enterprise is just one of many kind of support organisations out there that work with incubators, accelerators, we work with investors, we work with the Scottish Government to can do to try and give, give this one message about what we're all about, what we're supporting Scotland. So these um, brochures here kind of summarise that in terms of, I mean most importantly these focus on, they focus on who is Scottish Enterprise, who is Highlands Islands Enterprise, what are the organisations you've heard of, what do they do, what the difference, and when do you engage with them? If you start up and you're not right for Scottish Enterprise support, what's the, what's the path where you start? So that's what we're summarising here. And in the Scottish Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Guide, this is just an attempt at mapping out all the, <laughs> the many things that the, the number we've got to is really about 120 plus organisations across Scotland which are incubators, accelerators, co working spaces like Hotlines, <coughs> um, supports, networking organisations, all of the good stuff that's out there, but just kind of who they are, what we mean by when we categorise them like that, and how to contact them. So I know that the minute we've printed this, it's out of date because new things are springing up all the time, and that's a good thing, but just as a start, if you're starting out the ecosystem, even if you're not, just trying to get your head around who's out there and how can they help you. You've got these the table if you run out, just drop me an email, happy to send some out. What we'll do will be particularly relevant to, to you guys. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll kind of add to that and say this only works the whole ecosystem as a whole if we all work together. Um, and that's kind of what we try to champion here at Start of Grind. We want everyone to give first and say, How can I help? And those, those words get you open all sorts of doors to you and they open all sorts of different networks to you. Um, so we, we, we like to end it with every kind of fireside chat by asking how can we help. If anyone has any asks, come to us and we'll try to put you in touch with the right people in the right places um, so that they can help your business and help them grow. Um, so thanks very much for listening for the past hour. Um, I would like to 
add a couple of thank yous um, to our sponsors and partners um, towards the end. Um, thank you to Centella, these guys here, Glenn's here from Centella. Um, they are European patent attorneys, um, anything that you need in terms of IP. Um, they're very agile, so they'll, they'll work with you on moving to the likes of the US as well. They've got, they've got um, people working on that, they've got people working on um, European patents. So if you need any, anything to do with IP, speak to these guys. Um, or the beer that you're all drinking, um, that was provided by Brooklyn, um, so thank you very much to them. Um, the Clockwise, who provided us the space, um, and it's a fantastic space. Um, look from Digital Boost, who films every um, startup grind and is manfully sitting there with the camera. If you need anything filmed, look has been um, filmed startup grind for a long time now. He's absolutely fantastic, and he came through Kieran's program Orbit. Um, so been part of this ecosystem for a while. Um, and last last month, I forgot to um, thank one of our partners who helped us. It was Female Entrepreneurship Month last, or Female Leader Month last month. Um, and we worked with an organisation called Pioneers Playbook um, to try and increase diversity within our events. You'll probably notice that there's not too much diversity in a lot of events in Glasgow. We're trying to fix that and we're quite proud to say that we are one of the most diverse um, ecosystems in the world, but we are always trying to work on that and always trying to fix that. So Pioneer's Playbook helped us out with that. They do a lot of business consulting and business advice for female entrepreneurs. Um, so thank you to them. Um, and last of all, thanks to Cal for Cheers. giving us his time. And by the way, we do want woos <laughs> at the end of this. Um, so I'd like you to thank Callum um, or yourselves. Um, so, yeah, exactly. That's the best one I've had all, <laughs> had all year. Um, so I think there might be some Katie's or still beers and wine and stuff left. Um, we are, everyone needs to be out here by nine um, because clockwise have told us that. Um, so there is still beer, there's still wine. Feel free to make some friends and um, ask how you can help other people. So thank you very much for coming.